Good morning. I'm so privileged to be here, you know, addressing you know, such a beautiful uh, um, you know, audience uh, in Pune. So I have not been in Pune. Uh, I think I was just here once, maybe uh, 18, 18 years back or so. And I believe it's, uh, it's a wonderful city. Uh, I come from Toronto, uh, <clears throat> where you know I'm kind of freezing for four to six months in a year. And uh, when I uh, you know came in India, it felt really nice, really warm. Um, and uh, you know some of my friends were saying, you know, don't you feel hot here? I said I'm enjoying the heat here. <laughs> you know, I hardly get any heat there. So, so uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm having a good time here. Uh, just carry on uh, to um, you know other introduction here. You know, I I work with lots of large organizations, um, and in fact, you know, uh, during my career, I have always worked with big organizations. So, and when I work with them, I see a lot of patterns in these organizations, and uh, I would like to discuss about those patterns here. You know, maybe a lot of you might either be working with big organizations in their IT department or maybe you're consulting for big organizations. So in either case, what I'm going to talk about is going to apply. So I'm going to talk about something called the value stream mapping, uh, which kind of very well dovetails with what Marsha talked about, you know, that we don't focus, you know, we look at things more holistically. You know, we, we try to drive value, you know, from customer perspective. So all these things definitely apply here. So I'm, I'm very delighted to be here. So the way this, um, this presentation is going to work is, I'm going to first you know, show you how typically DevOps is implemented in large organizations today. All right? And then followed by that, you know, I'm going to share an experience. So, so what I'm going to talk about later when I talk about the value stream part of it is based on my experience working with large uh, enterprises, particularly the financial institutions. So I, I implemented that for one of the largest banks in Canada, and it was quite a success. So I thought it's, 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 it's great to share that with you all so that you can also you know, learn from you know, what I, I learned from you know, that experience and you know, pass it on to your customers or you can implement in your organization as well. <coughs> Uh, I understand there are a few students here, so for that matter, I'll probably cover some of the basics, uh, but maybe I won't go to the basic basic, but at least, you know, to a certain degree, I'll try to, you know, cover some of the acronyms or some of the, you know, concepts uh, that value stream. So, uh, let's dive into this. So if you have worked with big organizations, you know, this is kind of the iceberg, you know, but you see the dinosaur here? It's the dinosaur key. Okay, before we begin, I have a small goodie here, and this probably I'll hand out, you know, at the end. I'll probably ask a pop quiz towards the end, and whoever answers, you know, gets that. This is a period of caution. Keep you interested. All right, so we all know that in large organizations, we have a dinosaur city. What that means is, do we all know about technical depth? Yes. Yeah? All right, so have you heard of the term process depth? If you, if you work with large organizations, or even in a medium-sized organization, you would realize that you know, over a period of time, you know, new processes are added on top of the existing process. So it's kind of a layering over, you know, bunch of approvals that you need, you know, you have to fill this form, you have to, you know, have somebody assigned, you know, there will be a project coordinator, there will be a project manager sitting on top, and there will be a resource manager sitting on top. And you know, there are a whole bunch of layers that we build in large organization as the organization grows. Because when the organization is small and lean, you know, they are they are much agile. And as they grow, they become more like a dinosaur. You know, they can move, but you know, they cannot move so fast. 
Uh, so uh, over time, they don't only accumulate technical debts, which is quite, you know, probably you are all familiar with, you know, but they also accumulate a lot of process debt. You know, because they add lots of processes which are not necessary, you know, and they hardly get time to go back and look at those processes. So today we are going to talk a little bit from that perspective, you know, how we take a holistic look around the process, okay, and uh, you know, try to uh, use value stream to streamline the process. All right. So this is kind of a breed of, you know, uh, agile that we see in large organization. Uh, how many of you, I, I hope everybody is familiar with agile, right? Agile in development. Are you familiar with this? <laughs> yeah? Isn't it very common in big organizations? They start with this. You know? And what? They end with that. Very light. Because, but why? Probably I'll ask if anybody knows why. They start here. And they might be doing this over there. A bunch of automation over here. Okay, but they may not be able to move beyond that. They may not be able to expand beyond that development. Maybe you can share a couple of reasons. So um, cross-functional teams. You do not have a team that can do everything, so you can't do it. Good point. Yeah. Very I good. think uh, what I have seen, you know, at a lot of places is people are forced to do agile. They don't have a agile mindset, but they are forced to sit. You have to do it. So people present something, you know, they have to please their bosses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, very true. Because agile sometimes becomes a passion, you know. Everybody is adopting agile, so let's do it. Right? And it comes from the you know the senior executive C class, you know, C suite, without even understanding the urgency or the need of agile in the organization. Sorry, you have something to share. Yeah, I agree with him because uh, I face this issue in one of the team I asked that in one sprint they are doing the development and in another iteration they are doing the testing and they are calling it as agile. So uh, I asked them, so the answer I got is client what's in that way only. Okay. <laughs> so it is like client mindset is not clear, you know, not agile. So they have different perception about agile. That can be the, you know, difference. Yeah, so I think we are all familiar. Yes. Yeah, because it's the uh, because of lack of communication with the operation team. Even the operation team doesn't want to involve in the, all the phases. They, they want to spend uh, spend just on the department thing, and that's it. When we want to introduce in every phase, so that we can implement as I across uh, all phases. But they don't like that. They just like as I as said in Yes, it is. Yeah. The testing teams are not involved during the requirement and the analysis and when they start involving also they don't know what to do in those phases. So as they correctly said the mindset is not there so they don't know how to contribute towards it to make the other phases also agile along with the development phase. I feel the, one of the main reasons is priority, prioritization. Many a times the other uh, teams have started with the requirement analysis and all that but QA is still handling all these backlogs of the previous release. So if, even if they want to uh, get involved in the initial <coughs> stage, it is not possible because of the different priorities each stakeholder has. Yeah, absolutely. So all these divisions are valid. You know? And isn't it interesting that you open up the agile book, you know, and you read all those nice definitions, you know, you know, delivering value to the customer, you know, <coughs> reducing all the, you know, the need time, you know, kind of, so, you know, having end-to-end -end visibility and all those good stuff. But when, in, when we get into practice, what happens? This is what happens, exactly. You know, and I have, you know, I've been consulting with a lot of large uh, organizations and I see that, you know, they are getting great at this, you know, and they're stuck with this for, for years. You know, they do agile, but, you know, as, as all of you pointed out, you know, you know, there can be many waterfall within that agile framework. Okay, so let's look at some of the reasons, you know, why. So, can I go back to the previous one? Sure. 
So can we rename Breed of Agile in Bar Organization Instrument Food Class Project Program? Ah yes, it could be. Because organization, I don't think so is going to make any difference. It's a big organization or small organization. How you deploy the, your program? Yeah, there, there, you, you have, you have your, your point is valid. The reason I put there for large organization is typically in large organization, you have lots and lots of layers in the part. So you cannot, even if you have a very, very small project, I have a typical project where the development would be just a means development. But to deploy it into production and from end to end, it takes like months and months. You know, because it has to go through all those processes, you know, regardless. You know, even if it's small, whether it's a big project, you know, it doesn't matter. So if you take the other way, you know, example, let's say you have a small, like a very lean organization, and they're executing big projects, Maybe they are much more agile than you know bigger organization even executing small project. That was the you know why thinking behind putting it larger organization. So it's operational overhead instead of technical or yeah, it's uh, operational technology process. overhead. Yeah, operational process overhead. <coughs> Lots of process overhead. So that's where that's what uh, you know, I'm going to discuss about you know, how how we try to identify those, you know, and take a holistic look, not just automating. You know, not just old planning that what we already have. And some of, uh, yeah, I'd like to share one story. You know, this, uh, uh, these are some of the typical, sorry. Uh, what's the harm in using the previous implementation? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, can you take the mic and move it? Can you go back to the previous slide? What is the harm in uh, implementing this model? What is, what yeah. is the harm? Well, you tell me what is the harm. <laughs> <laughs> no, because if, if I see that, okay, if you give them sufficient time for the QA, you know, ultimately if uh, the QA is responsible for the release, okay, they get the sufficient time if you uh, give a, 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 a proper, the, all, all type of testing they can able to do it in the way they want to, instead of forcing them to do it in the specific time. So uh, I feel that okay, if it is if it isn't working, okay, if it is being given value to the customer, okay, um, I don't see any harm in doing this. Okay, so I, I wish I had time to do agile one one here, but um, you know all these things that we see all over the place, you know, this will basically spin into this. You know, everything should be agile. You know, we should not have a separate you know QA, separate UAT, separate release. You know, a separate requirement analysis and all those stuff, right? Because the harm it is doing is we are not delivering value to the customer, you know, uh, in, a, in a much more agile way, in much because what what do you mean by agile to begin with, right? So so if if you look at the definition of you know what agile is, it means you know the requirements keep changing, you know. We should be able to adapt to all the changing requirements. We should be able to deliver value to our customer, you know, at the time they ask for, you know, and those kind of stuff. So, you know, if we follow this model, which is much easier for large organization to begin with, that's what they're doing. You know, it is not really giving benefit to them. You know, they, you know, probably they might claim that you know earlier our average time to market was 12 months. Now we reduced it to six months. Rabble, right? But, but again, you know, is that what it is all about, right? So, so that's you know, it's it's, it's kind of an interesting debate. Maybe we can talk over, you know, over the coffee or something. But, you know, um, I I'd love to stick on this slide, but this is my second slide, and uh, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm actually excited to talk about this, and I'm happy to see you know, a lot of interest uh, on this slide. Maybe I pop this this slide somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so um, you know these are you know I, I shared you know in the previous slide you saw you know, you know how we do a local optimization, right? Just in the development piece and we forget about the back. And some of the faults are these, you know. Again talking about the large organization thing. You know, how many, okay, let me ask, have you heard of some, or maybe in your company, or maybe in your client's organization, have you heard of this? 
अरे देवास डिपार्टमेंट हाँ इसमें इसमें इंटरेस्टिंग when you look in the you know when when you read all the good books about devops we talk about devops as a culture right and here we are creating a department right and and what what do they do this yes yes most of the time you know i'm good at installing jenkins right <laughs> so, so i'm on you know that i'm devops <laughs> That's how it works. And this is the most interesting one. You know, I, I want to share one story. I was in uh, DevOps uh, Toronto conference two years back. I met one guy. He's you know, and he's I was just introducing myself, and he said, you know, I'm DevOps manager. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> I, I asked him, okay, tell me, um, what do you do? Uh, or You know, he said, "You know, I manage a team." Uh, okay. <laughs> so, what what your team does? He said, "You know, my team they install a, a tool uh, that is used by the developers and by the testers." Awesome. Uh, what what was your designation before? And he said, "You know, my designation was IT uh, manager of operations." Say, so, uh, what did you do before? He said, I manage a team, right? And what did you do? Said, they install tools. <laughs> awesome. So what is the difference? What do you do now? You got a new title, fancy title. That's great. Uh, but what is the difference? Said, now my team also installs Jira and Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is how, you know, unfortunately, lots of big organizations you know, think they think they're boss. And probably you know you're 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 laughing at, but that's the fact. You know, and we are all accepting that fact, right? Because we believe that you know our clients are saying so, so that is right. You know, or our executives are believing it that this is the only way we can you know scale in a big organization, start from development. Because why are we doing so? You know, I'll give you another example. You know, I had. Uh, You know, one of the VP who took over the DevOps responsibility, right? And uh, he was from the development side of the house, you know, because typically a lot of organizations will have a development house and operations and all. Those. So, what do you think that guy does? You know, that guy will operate in his own circle of influence. That guy has no idea in you know, how to manage the teams, in you know, how to ensure that the deployment happens properly in production. You know. So that person was solely dedicated to you know the development part of the things, you know, to having you know all the tools for the developers, you know, in the right place. So all those kind of stuff. So the same thing happens even for the people, or if you have a Leaders on the other side of the house, you know, if the, if we have a leader who takes over the DevOps responsibility on the operations side, who was previously doing operation stuff, what is going to happen? That person is going to work around his or her circle of influence. That's how it operates. You know, because they don't have control or visibility, at, you know, end to end. You know, unless it goes all the way to the CEO, and the CEO doesn't have time to do DevOps, they have got a lot of other things to do. So these are some of the typical, you know, strategies a lot of companies use, you know, or I should say, you know, abuse. Okay, it's not really it. So the the fact is, you know, without all, you know, without having any clear visibility, you know, what they're doing, you know, I got this. You know, manager on this side, uh, another manager on the, on the other side of the house, and 
you know, they ask for funding, saying, you know, I need something to do my DevOps. You know, the other guy says, I need funding to do my DevOps. You know, everybody is doing that, but, you know, there is, there is uh, probably nobody who pulls, you know, puts all the puzzles together. That's the challenge with any big organization. Because everybody is focusing on their local circle of influence you know, and, and you know, believing that they are doing they want. So, so that's 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 what the you know the challenge is. So let's talk about now. How do you get around that? Um, so, so the exam, uh, you know, the real life uh, experience that I had with one of the largest bank in Canada was, uh, you know, we had a process architect. Very few banks they are process architects. You know, to do DevOps. And the guy I work with, he, he never ever worked in IT. <laughs> never. He had no idea, you know, what a requirement specification document is. He has no idea what a test script is. He had tremendous experience working in manufacturing. You know, because all these concepts, as you would know, you know, in, you know, all the lean concepts in terms of Georgia, and you know, all the manufacturing, they adopted it first, and then we're trying to put it on top of, you know, IT, you know, without even realizing the end-to-end, -end, right? So, uh, sorry, I lost my chain of thought here. Um, so let me, let me get into some of the basic concepts around the value stream. Um, you know, map, how you create a, um, you know, a value stream so that you get the visibility, you know, end-to-end -end rather than local optimization. So I'll go through some of the concepts here. Before before that, let's, let's, let's talk about what a value stream is. I think Mas had touched upon that a bit. Uh, you know, so this is, a, this is basically a lean enterprise technique, you know, where you look at the flow of information from one end to the other end. You know, so you look at the entire piece of you know, the flow of information. These, these, this, as I said, this technique you know, started from manufacturing and now it, it came into IT. And uh, uh, so, you know, in a, in a, probably most of you would have worked, you know, created a flow chart or something, right? So if you're not familiar with you know, value stream, just think of, you know, you're creating your flowchart, but at a much higher level. Okay, so you can start from the top. You know, let, let's say you're doing a development, you know, and then you are, you, you know, forget about agile for a moment. You know, even if you're doing waterfall, you know, you think of all the steps that you go through and, and you know, create a simple diagram that have all these steps, you know, how much time it takes. You know, so I'll go through some of the concepts here. You know, and then we'll see you know, how you draw a diagram and then value stream. So some of the key elements uh, of value stream is, you know, whenever, as I said, when, when you start putting all your activities together, so start with, let's start with a simple process. Let's start with a QA process. Okay, the nice QA we saw on the right side. So let's start with that. So maybe um, I need a volunteer to tell me you know, like four or five steps that you do it as part of your QA testing. Step number one. <coughs> All right, so maybe the test plan creation, step number two. So after you have the test plan, what do you do? Yes, right. Okay, so great. There is no right a wrong answer, you know, it might depend on the project too, so that's fine. So you have, you know, test plan, you have the test cases, what is the third one? Test environment. Okay, test environment. Set up, and then? Execution of test, maybe the last one. I'm just keeping it short for now. The last one could be, you know, you just want to verify your test, you know, and analyze it, right? So let's say you have all this step. So what you do here is, <coughs> You know, when you have all these steps, you figure out, you know, are these steps a value-add step? So what does that mean? 
So rather than that is an, any activity you know, that we do, this part is the most important. So when you create a test plan and you go to a customer and say, hey, Mr. Customer, are you paying for this test plan? What do you think the customer's answer is? Yeah? No? Do you agree? Very likely you say, no. What the heck is test plan? No, I don't care. Right? So is that a value add activity? Yes? Yeah. So that's an interesting debate. So I'll get get on to that. Alright? So for now let's assume that the customer is not willing to pay for your test plan. Alright? Because if I'm the customer, I'll ask, why are you creating a faulty product in the first place? So you create a test plan. Right? Create something which I don't even have to test. Right? I don't bother about your test. I worry about my end product. <coughs> so, so when you think of value add, think from that perspective. If I am going to ask my customer, you know, are you willing to pay for it? If they say no, which means it is not a value add. That's the very simple, you know, the very simple litmus test that you you can execute that of your activity. Okay. So let's talk about uh, non-value add or waste. This is the most important concept when we talk about value stream. Because when you look, look at the value, you know, the best thing is to take out all the non-value add stuff. You know, it is like treating a patient, you know, with cancer. Basically, you're trying to take out, you know, all the, all the bad tissue which is in the body, right? So when you do that, you know, the body will be healthy. So maybe not the best analogy I have, but, um, you know, when we talk about the non-value add, that's, it is all about, you know, where the customer is not willing to pay for that piece of work, and, <clears throat> and which is a pure, pure waste. Now, so I'll talk about a bit of, you know, different types of waste, probably, if you have, you know, gone through some of the lean, uh, you know, courses, uh, you might have, you know, uh, yeah, you might be familiar with some of them. But I'll just quickly review that for, for it as a reflection. So there are two types of non-value add. You know, one is, you know, a pure waste. So, you know, that is given that it is waste, right? And another is, we call it non-value add necessary. Again, uh, be mindful that that itself is a non-value add to begin with. We call it necessary because of some reasons. You know, sometimes, you know, maybe for the compliance reason. If you're working in the financial industry, you know, there's a lot of regulations and compliance, right? So maybe for compliance reason, you know, you say that, you know, it doesn't add any value to my customer, but I have to do it because it's part of the compliance, right? So maybe call it as non-value as necessary, okay? So that you know that it's not adding value, but still I need to do that, you know? But this is a trap. You know, a lot of people <laughs> try to throw, you know, this, you know, they think this is the kitchen sink, you know, through everything. You know, even if I have a lot of processes and approvals and, you know, all different layers, you know, what I'll say, you know, it is necessary. Okay? So I've seen, you know, um, if you have, once you complete your test, let's say, uh, what are the next steps? Let's say you completed your test, you have the test result, what's the next step? Go for approval, right? Somebody has to check. Maybe multiple layers of approval, right? So maybe the development team first says, or the BA says, okay, this is good. Then it goes to the manager, development manager says, okay, good. You know, and in some cases it might even go up. You know, saying, okay, let's have a go no go meeting, right? Based on this test results and see if it works. You know, whether we decide to go or not go, you know, ahead with this, with, uh, you know, with this piece of software that we created. So. You know, in a nutshell, these are the two types of non-value add when you, you know, once you lay out your activities and you say, you know, this piece of mind, this, this step 
is a non-value add, then you can categorize it further, saying it's necessary or not necessary. Or sort of pure waste. So just talking about the waste, these are the various types of waste. Um, you know, uh, so, so how many of you are already familiar with these types of waste? Put a few hands here. Good. Maybe as part of your lean six sigma and all those kind of stuff, we have to respond to this. One thing I would like to point out here is, you know, there's a huge correlation between all the different types of waste. You know, for example, uh, you know, you have a context of task switching. You know, why do you why do you have to switch from one task to other? So let's say you are, uh, you know, on the operation side, and uh, you know you are creating an environment for different project teams, right? Let's say you are creating setting up a QA environment for different project teams, and you start with one piece of work, you know, and then for one of the one of the teams, and then you switch to another, uh, you know, you switch to another. Team. Why it might happen? Why you might have to switch from one to other? One reason could be, you know, you're, you know, you're waiting for approval. You got the, you know, so-called, uh, I forget the term. You know, it's, it's like, you know, you got the, in, you, you got your first request, right? Some ticket is paid, right? Some interesting ticket. Somebody has to pay a ticket to get something done. And that ticket came to me. Let's say I'm one of the SA, you know, who creates this environment. And I, could, I, I get the ticket, but oh, now I need a tool from one of my manager to get this done. Okay. So I'm waiting. By that time, okay, I let me review the other ticket, you know, and see whether we have some, you know, some server line somewhere that I can utilize. So then again, I switch. So there are a whole bunch of reasons why people switch from one task to other. The point I'm trying to make here is, you know, that the task switching is probably because of a lot of unfinished work, you know, which is, in, which is in, you know. Were there. And therefore, they're all related to each other. So, for the benefit of the rest of uh, you know the rest of the folks here, I would like to just quickly go through this. So, work in progress is a type of waste. Yeah. And then, because uh, it also leads to context switching. And then, of course, I talked about context switching part. You know, wait time is a waste. You know, if you're waiting for something, doing nothing, that's a waste. You know, overdoing uh, is a type of waste, which is, you know, in large part of organization, you will see lots of layering that I've talked about before. <coughs> then uh, doing extra things <coughs> is a waste. Sometimes you just develop something because you feel more comfortable doing it. You know, I learned a new technology, let me try that, okay? which is not necessary, which is not needed by the customer. They never requested for it, but since I, you know, I, I, I love to, you know, code and, uh, you know, I, I love to try new technology because I get, you know, my drowning point from my manager because I tried that, so I'm good. Uh, handoffs. This is a big one. This is very interesting. I'm going to talk a little bit about this later. Handoffs, uh, you know, I have a very nice diagram and very close to, you know, that I did for you know, one of uh, my clients. So handoff is, and then, you know, it's, you start with one piece of work, pass it on to somebody else, you know, and then that person takes and pass it on to somebody else. You know, so you start hand off with maybe you know have one person in the center of the circle, let's say you know the, the kind of a bike, you know the, the wheel of the bike, yeah, the center. You do a lot of spokes around yeah, that, and you know whoever this person interacts with, maybe you can create a diagram of that. I'll show you one of the diagram here, and, and then you. Know, you see that how many handoff if you just look at one person, you know, you know it, it has to, or you can just take a process, you know, a step, and see how many handoff has to happen. You know, somebody pays the ticket, somebody approves the ticket, you know, somebody does the, you know, uh, just the OS installation, you know, somebody does the cloud provisioning, you know, somebody does the, you know, database tuning, you know, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that has to be done before one, you know, piece of work gets done. So that is the handoff. And I think somebody talked about you know being a self-contained autonomous team you know, because you don't have that, and that's the fundamental reason you know why uh, we have so many 
hand off in organizations. And defects, of course, uh, you know, because it leads to a lot of rework and also context switching because you know you throw that defect. Let's say you are, you know, uh, you are uh, identifying defect within a sprint, and then that defect is thrown back to the developer. Now the developer is working on something, right? He's focusing on getting something done. And now the defect is slapped in his face. So, oh, great. So defect, I have to now work on the defect, right? And then, so it, it, you know, it kind of uh, distracts the developers as well. And this is one of the, this is not an industry statistic. This is based on my experience you know, with working with a lot of large organizations that, you know, I have observed up to 90% 90% of waste in, in, in a process. Okay, so that's huge. That's huge. And you know the reason why lots of organizations don't realize that is because you know it's kind of you know they live and breathe. You know it's kind of you know gradually they are um, you know these uh, these elements are added not all of a sudden. You know it was added gradually over time. So that's the reason that people don't realize that you know we are having this as a waste. How many of you have heard about the boiling frog story? Do you know about the boiling frog? Yeah. Right. So it's like that, you know. Just for you know, I'll just quickly review that for the sake of others. You know, you take a pot of water, you know, and put a frog in that. Frog will be very happy dancing. And, you know, you light a candle. You know, let the Water. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me go that way. Uh, so you boil the water. You know, boil a pot of water. You know, like boiling pot. Throw a frog in that. You know what's going to happen? The frog is going to jump out of the pot because we realize that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm boiling. It will, it will go out. But it's the same thing you do. Take it normal water, you know, and put a frog in that and start boiling it gradually. You know, frog doesn't even realize that, you know, the water is heating up and it will die, you know, when the water boils. So, so that's what happens with large, large of big organization because all these changes are in the process which are added over time. It's like that, you know, slow boiling frog. Don't realize that these changes are happening and it's very not stop. So they can't see, you know, they're blind to that. Uh, cycle time is pretty straightforward. This is all about, you know, the time takes to complete any activity, including any delay, okay, which is been different from the effort. So effort is all around, you know, what is the actual work, you know, which is being done without any delay. So I'll just put a couple of you know, examples that you can show effort is less than 96 hours, but you know, cycle time could be days, right? So maybe you took 15 days to do the work, but actual, you know, the human effort that was required to do that uh, was 96 hours. And hand up. So it is, I yeah, already talked about this, you know, passing. So this is, you know, one of the, you know, it's very close to, this is very close to the real one, okay? So I didn't make it up. So you can see that <laughs> there is a test lead. And these are the number of interactions this test lead has to do just for one piece of work, you know, which is less than performance testing in this case. Okay, so he has to interact with so many people. And if you look at these arrows, you can count all these arrows. So these are the number of handoffs that is happening. So and uh, you know you can you can put a name to that handoff, and also you can say you know what is the artifact, you know what is the document or what is the piece of information that flows from one to the other, you know. So that's one way to think. And when when we talk about you know creating a value stream and and a way to optimize, those are the things you want to look at. You know, are those necessary? You know, or is it a waste? And then how much effort is required? You know, many times we just, how much do we, <laughs> this is mostly uh, So tell me honestly, when you write an email to somebody, 
Okay. How many of you make sure that you don't copy people who don't who you know that they're not going to act? <laughs> yeah. We always copy them. Yeah, because oh our boss is watching me, right? Our boss is watching me, so let me copy my boss just to make sure that I'm working. Yeah. So that's what we do. And what is that? That's kind of waste. Why? Let's say I'm the boss. You know, I have like 20 team members working, and they're all copying all the emails that I send out. <coughs> what is going to happen to me? First, I'll, I'll start reading to be a new to the organization. I'll start reading all those emails and wasting my time, right? Or, you know, I'm gradually, what I'll do, I'll start ignoring those emails. But still, that email is comes to my desk. I have to spend at least a minute, right? Just quickly skim through that email and to see whether there is something for me. So that's again a waste. So you know, if you look at this is a very small example, but this is how we create waste unknowingly, right? And that's that's one example of handoff too. This is an indirect handoff. You know, you're not directly handing off your work to somebody, but just by means of seizing somebody, you know, without even realizing that you know you are wasting somebody else's time. All right, so let's uh, talk about how do we, since we learned about some of the concepts here around the DevOps, uh, sorry, uh, around the value stream map. Let's talk about you know how do we do in a uh, you know in an organizational setup. So first of all, you know, uh, as we talked about the, uh, here, probably I made the assumption that you know, there is no DevOps. Okay. So even if there is a DevOps, you probably see that slide number two. Okay. Now, if that's the case, what you do is you create a value stream for the development part of it. Okay. So it's easier. You know, just do it bite size. Don't try to boil those. You know, don't try to do everything for the organization. So stick with the development part to begin with. So that is your current value stream map. You know, because what is your current state? And when you outline that current state, identify all the waste, all the value adds, and all those kind of good stuff. And what you do is you do your ESM uh, for for the operations part. Because we're talking about DevOps here. So first you do for the dev, and second you do for the operations. And both 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 of them are for current. Okay, so there's no brainer. It's, 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 it's like, you know, you just, and again, uh, I was giving the example of the process architect, you know, who had no idea about IT. You know what? <coughs> he did a fantastic job. Why? Because he was not blind to himself. Because he came from a manufacturing background, so he was pretty much questioning everything. Who is frustrating me? But at the same time, you know, it will make me realize, you know, to rethink that, oh, yeah, this is a waste. This is a waste. This is a waste. He, he kept repeating that, you know, on me. And then I said, no, this is required. Why is it required? You know, at one point he said that the entire test cycle itself is a waste. <laughs> Come on. You know, and then we argued that maybe, you know, how did this you know, I've got the automated test execution. I think this is a value, right? You say, but if you write this, will your customer pay for this? Uh, and no answer. So, you know, sometimes it helps to have somebody, you know, from outside, you know, who has no idea about IT. You know, that was a great experience for me. You know, it was frustrating in the beginning, but once I realized that, you know what, what this guy is saying, He's challenging lots of my assumptions and beliefs, and that, and 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 at the end, you know, everybody appreciated, you know, the outcome that came out of it. There, you saw, I as I told that up to 90 percent of waste, you know, we were able to identify just because of the, that fact. If it was me just doing it, probably it would be just 10 percent waste. And I'll say, oh yeah, it is required because I have. You know, probably all of us, you know, we live and breathe IT all the time, and we think that these are these are all necessary, right? 
but we never look from that customer perspective whether the customer believes that this is necessary. And then the, la the third but the most important step is to create a value stream for the future state. When you create this future step, you see the dev and offer merged together. You don't do separate because this is your current. You know, you're here you're doing for your development part, your uh, your operations part, but you, when you do the the future one, assume that it's all together and, and create a value stream. So this is one uh, you know quick example of probably how you can start. Right? So you start with this is one of the interesting ones, maybe some of the Agile code to challenge this, you know, Spring Zero and hardening sprints and all those fancy names that we put to this spin to hide our, uh, you know. Uh, so, so what you do is, you know, you put all your activities here. You don't have to read through this because it might be different for your settings. So it, it, it's not necessary that it's going to be exactly like this. It's, it depends from organization to organization and from process to process. And then what you do is, this is one of the most, this is what executives love to see, okay? So they, they don't like this, this is too much. So, so what you do is, you know, do your analysis. You know, and as part of the analysis, you also do something here. What is this is, you know, let's say you pick uh, uh, you know, integration test. And then list out all your small, you know, detail level activities for the integration task, and you know, put the effort, you know, that is required. And uh, I think I'm missing here. So on the in the column here, you have all different people, you know, who are involved. Okay, and and you put the effort required by that person, you know, or maybe a team or whatever it is. You know, it can be at a higher level, it can be a super low level, whatever. Know, is appealing to you, you can do that. And then you mark it as red, yellow, or green. So red means this effort or this activity, don't, don't bother about the effort here for now. You know, so this activity is non-value add. So you mark it red. Okay? And then this activity, green, is the value add activity. Okay? The yellow one, you know, it's a non-value add but necessary at the moment. Okay, so maybe, so, so that's how you, you do all this and, and then you count the amount of effort that you're putting for all the non-value add stuff, you know, which are waste and, you know, you can, you, you can put in your summary here as well. Okay, so, so that's how, when you show this to the executive, you know, first of all, the very first thing that is going to happen, you know what? They're going to challenge you that why you think it is a non value add. Okay? Because they believe, you know, as I, as, I, as I said before, that if we were to do that, you know, we assume all these things are okay and we just do it because that is necessary. Okay? So probably you might have to hire some you know, external consultant or somebody who is outside of the organization or somebody who, is, who really understands this process or influential, you know, to make this happen. Otherwise, I can bet that you're going to receive a lot of resistance. Okay. Um, so, and, and, and to, to get around that, the best thing you can do is you know, first establish the definition of value and non-value even before showing this with your executives. Okay? So once you establish the definition and they agree on that definition, now you start doing this. You know, then they cannot challenge this. Okay? But if you start showing this, then, then they are going to be challenged. Because they, they think, oh, am I not doing the right job? Am I doing like 90% of my job is a waste? Are you kidding me? So they are going to, you know, they don't accept it. All right, so at the end, as I said, you, know, you just summarize it. You know, you can say you have 15% value add, you have 32% non-value add, let's say 53% you know, non-value add, but necessary. So this, this kind of summarization is important to communicate your message all the way. All right, so the, this is probably the last slide here. 
so the next step is to when you create your future value add, sorry, value stream map, which is your target state, you, know, you focus on eliminating the waste. You know, how do we focus? You know, so basically ask these questions. You know, ask whether, you know, can we avoid task switching? Is there a way for this particular, you know, for this particular person to be focused and work on just one piece of, you know, complete one piece of work, you know, before getting into something else. You know, can we get closer to effort and cycle time? As we talked about, you know, 96 hours of effort and cycle time is 15 days, right? So, so in ideal case, both would be same, pretty much, you know, because uh, we are then not wasting any time. Uh, can the process shift left? Can you set shift something from right to left? You know, like you're testing from having a separate phase. Can we include that part of the sprint or even you know have a TDD kind of approach or BDD kind of approach? <coughs> Is approvals necessary? You know, ask those questions. Can handoff be reduced? So these are some of the questions that you ask. Uh, you know, and, and try to eliminate those ways. <coughs> of course, there are too many moving parts, right? Uh, so, so to make all this happen, sorry, this was not my last one. So you know, this is the piece that we talked about, but to tie them all together, this is kind of in, uh, you know, inspired from Potter's eight, eight step change management. If you're familiar with, or you can read about that. That's a very, you know, nice uh, framework that applies for organization change management. So you can apply the same, uh, and it's very much aligns to that. Okay. So you start with the scope, you know, you set your goals, and this is the most important piece I'll, I'll just touch upon. So make your team, when you create a team to do this value stream map, don't do it in isolation. You know, have teams from all different spaces. The example I was giving you that, you know, the bank I work for, you know, we had person, you know, from operations, from security, you know, from testing, we had from uh, business side. You know, from UI, you kind of imagine why we had UI, but they were there. So we had from all around, you know, around 18 to 20 different, you know, silos, and they were part of the team. So that is very important because then you get a buy-in. It's much easier to get get a buy-in when you have everybody there. And I think we focus on that, and that's pretty much. So how do we get? How do we untangle the entire mess? So these are the key takeaways. So take a holistic approach. Uh, team composition is the key. Uh, focus on eliminating waste. You know, don't focus on goal planning because we tend to focus on you know whatever is already there. Automate on top of that and communicate and visualize your outcome to get a buy. And that concludes pretty much. So this is the visualization part of it. That concludes my presentation. One or two questions uh, uh, before we take a break. So, any questions? Quick questions for Sanjeev? Do we have a mic somewhere? Yes. Any queries, guys? Yeah. Can you pass? Keep it easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nice presentation, thank you. I but the question that I had was, uh, especially on defining the base, when you say non-value adds, non-value adds is such a perspective term in yes. terms of non-value add can be a value add for me. Yeah. Only non-value add for a customer. Um, customer may be only interested, for example, in a website. Right. Rest all development becomes non-value add for you. Test it becomes non-value add. How do you scope it? How do you make it scope out of scope? Scope out of scope. Okay. I asked you to ask a simple question. <laughs> uh, there is no simple answer to this. Okay. Because you know the definition of value add and non-value add, as I mentioned before, you know, try to establish as upfront. You know, have as many uh, what do you say? Uh, as many uh, representation from all different departments. You know. So if you if you just Let's say you're starting, you're starting to define that and you have only the business folks there, what's going to happen? They're not even going to bother about anything else. Right? And if you have only the operations guys, the same thing is going to happen. Because they will work only within their circle of influence, you know, whatever they believe. 
So in this case, you know, you might need to have a much broader session with people and say, you know, these are the principles based on which we define in our context. I think it is context sensitive, right? The same thing might be valuable for an organization, but it may not be valuable for the other organization, right? So as long as everybody buys into that definition, you're good. You, know, you don't have to, there is no straight answer. It is, it is more like a, you know, you go and consult and you know, work with all these guys and you know, publish this, and then the rest will work based on that. Does that help? Okay. See, uh, in the benefit of time, I think there could be a lot of questions, Ramit, so, and we are bringing out for D. Uh, Sanjeev, don't go anywhere. One, one Okay. So, you want to ask a quiz? Yeah. Okay, one question from Sanjeev before we take a break. Sanjeev, all right. Okay, so my question is, what, what word I use the most during my presentation? I mean, I mean, you know. You know. You know. You know. You know. You know. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so I'll make other judge. What do you think? I can't be a judge because everybody is saying you know and I can't pick up somebody who only one person saying that. You got to pick, Sanjeev. This is your task. Oh, that's difficult. Oh. All right. Yes, sir. 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 Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. Which one? 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 Which and calling and a very knowledgeable session a uh, great keynote from you thank you once again quick announcement guys can we have your attention before you move out for tea break one uh, after this there are four parallel tracks and the parallel tracks uh, are outside so all four parallel tracks are not there is no, nothing happening in this room now all four four parallel tracks are outside so there is two classrooms out there track one and track two and then on second floor track three and track four uh, if you need any help in finding out where those are, let us know. Volunteers are outside. Uh, also, the competition, the second competition is being announced. So, if you look, we, I told you that the person who has the maximum tweets and maximum engagements gets one trophy. The second trophy that we have for the competition that we are announcing is the selfie contest. <laughs> and the selfies again goes on Twitter with the dopa handle. So this also would lead you to maybe win both the trophies if you are also tweeting with DOPA17 and you also tweet lot of selfies and the good ones. So selfie is not about number of selfies, the quality of selfie matter. So make sure that you understand. So here we are, two competitions for all of us to participate in and lot of learning. That's why we have been talking about uh, hashtag infinite learning. With that please go ahead. Have your break. Thank you.